Jupiter and Saturn enter Aquarius this week. Saturn is going to enter Aquarius four minutes after midnight tonight, Eastern time. So um, that's really soon because right now it's around 2.30. So that's like less than eight. No, it's like 10 hours. That's like less than 10 hours from now. Um, and then um, Jupiter is going to enter Aquarius Saturday, just two days later, around 8 a.m. Eastern time. Um, Saturn has been in Capricorn for the last three years, and it's entering Aquarius. Um, it's going to spend um, a couple years there. And Jupiter is entering Aquarius, is going to spend a year there. Okay, so this is a powerful shift from Capricorn to Aquarius. Because for the last three years, Saturn in Capricorn has been requesting two things from us more than any other, which is that we get real with the way that we use power and that we get real with the way that we use time. It turns out if you go deep enough into either one, you actually end up with the other because the way we use time is a strong um, connection to the way we use power. If we let time dominate us, we're giving away power. And the way that we use power turns out to have a lot to do with the way we use time because, because time is the universe's way of synchronizing uh, with your own soul nature, with your living beingness. Now in the modern world, it might be hard for you to think of that as time because that's not the way society <laughs> deals with time. Time is the universe's way of finding you and synchronizing with you. Modern time is a scientific um, regimentation of very natural movements and flows that time has to it, all presented in like the idea of a marching band. That kind of time, what we think of as time, what almost everyone on the planet except very wacky people and, um, and some indigenous tribes, the way that, that way that time gets used right now is as a, um, a slave driver. We think it's actually real. We think it's actually real. That like being 37 is um, much different than being 12. And so what happens is time dominates the space and when we're a victim of it, we're not in our true power. So when the ancient astrologers linked power and time to Capricorn, they, they were sending messages that the last three years has been knocking on our door over and over. Get real with how you use time. Get real with power. Get real with time. Get real with power. And that's been quite a, an initiatory summons and demand. Um, and we've seen a lot of outbreaks of false power, though we don't usually relate them to false time. We, we rarely think to say um, somebody is out of power because of the way that they're dealing with time. So we get that Capricornian um, mystical uh, um, X-ray vision when we look through power into time. This period where Saturn's been asking that of us is drawing to a close because Saturn's about to enter Aquarius for the next couple of years. So however well you really did with getting real with power and time, um, that's the level that you're gonna bring in towards Saturn and Aquarius. You, don't, you, you only have a few more hours to deal with that one. <laughs> and, and, um, and so, you know, whatever you did with it, that's what you did. So whatever level you're at of using power and using time, um, it's going to get Aquarianized pretty soon, which means that um, – 
regardless of the way that you're dealing with power and time or any of the other things of your body and your, um, and your human nature, um, you are now going to be recruited into the Galactic Space Corps. And the Galactic Space Corps is, um, is busy um, skimming through the higher regions of human consciousness. So the place where, uh, where you know that you are a creature made of uh, stars and love and magic, the higher regions of collective consciousness is where the Galactic Space Corps has been skimming around. And, and as Saturn and Capricorn moves into Aquarius, it kind of doesn't matter anymore how well you've been doing with this human thing here. Um, it's like you're going to have your imperfections and sloppiness. You know, you're, you're going you're gonna to be like every other human being, imperfect. And, and regardless of that, you're getting recruited into the core who, um, who realizes that there's this frothy Aquarian mist there's this frothy Aquarian mist of evolution, like a perfume atomizer spray. It's like an etheric spray. And, and this, the Aquarian spray is frothy. It's, it's because it's the, it's the edge of an evolutionary wave. And the evolutionary- I have to love you, only you can get away with this shit. Like only you can get away with the frothian Aquarian mist. I could never get away with that, people. <laughs> and I love you for it. We need a man who will say frothy Aquarian mist. Yeah, because that's what it is. I mean, how could it be anything <laughs> other than like this atomized perfume of love evolution? It's like, you know, because Aquarians remember prior to the fall of Atlantis in Lemuria, in the first stage of humanity, um, we, were, we were undivided wholeness. We, we did not experience I and thou. There was no other. There was no you and me. And the me that was, the you that was in Lemuria was this man, woman, frog, toad, star, lake, icicle. There, there, what, there, there, you couldn't detach any of it. The stars were who you were and the earth was. And all the future incarnation of humanity is who you were. And all the galactic tides that you arose out of is who you were. And we still all are that. We've never lost that. We didn't lose that. It's just our conscious natures forgot that that's also who we were as we took on karmas and bodies and entered the, the reincarnational chain. So that frothy atomized mist is just this reminder that, that we still are all one. There is no separation between Saturn and you. There is no separation between cosmos and you. There is no separation. There, there's just a, um, a coagulation of molecules in the vicinity of your human nature that makes you over identify with that part of being human as if being human is somehow not being the whole cosmos. Because you're all your past lives. You're not just Marianne Morrissey, you're Marianne Morrissey and the person you were last time and the one you were before that. And you're not just Marianne Morrissey and the person you were in your last lifetime and the one before that. You're also all those things and the people they made love with and their ancestors. You're everyone. If you go back far enough, you are Adam and Eve. You're all of it. You're black, white, red, green, male, female, spirit, earth, clay. You're still in the Lemurian state. That is the common Aquarian experience. It's common for Aquarius to be born knowing that we are all parts of each other. Aquarius is born knowing that. The Aquarian part of all of you was born knowing that we are all parts of each other, which means it's, 
it flummoxes Aquarius over and over and over to try and understand why people and governments refuse to acknowledge that basic fact. This is what Aquarius will never understand. How could it be? How could such a thing be that everybody on earth knows that they are all parts of each other and that almost nobody acts that way? And governments do everything in their power to prevent that from happening. This is the Aquarian conundrum because when you're, when you're dwelling on the fringe of that atomized mist where it meets incarnation and politics and sex and everything of culture that's going on here and in the body, when, when you're at that intersection, if you, if you identify too much with the mist, you abandon your work on earth, you leave the rest of them to deal with it without you. And that's like abandoning angels. But if you get too caught in the incarnational pull of gravity, that you enter the human karmic gumbo to the point where it starts, it starts hurting your body, then that's too far in. So this Aquarian balancing act, this, this performance piece goes on as a lifelong initiation. How much of the mist do you dwell within and ah, ah, oh my God, Hawaii, the sea, foam, ah, evolution. Oh my God, the 1960s, John Lennon music. Oh my God, ah, ooh, ah, orgasm. And how much of that do you come down from in order to be more of service to the karmic boneyards and the fields and of evolution? It's this Aquarian back and forth motion because you, if you stay too far up and away, it, it fills you, it glorifies you, but you have this sense that you're not doing your work. And if you come too far down, you have a strong sense that you're doing your work, but it's hard to know where help is going to ever come from because it, humanity is so fucking dense and resistant. And so there's this Aquarian um, angelic arc. It's like from, from the atomized mist into incarnation and to the atomized mist and into incarnation and back and forth like a spider, like the great spider just weaving this web so that you bring the inklings and the knowings of the higher regions down into the boneyards and the blood fields of everything that's happening down here. But you don't get so caught in it and lost in it that you confuse that with the fullness of your true nature. Even while you're attending the boneyards, you're, um, you're, you're uh, floating through paradise. It's not, you don't do, have to do one at the expense of the other. After you've paid a visit to enough of the um, different axes enough to uh, claim your citizenship in, in two worlds so that you belong fully to spirit, that is your land. And you belong entirely to earth and you're never gonna get out of that, even if you die. And when, when Aquarius becomes that at home and belonging to both sides, that's when it happens. That's when you become this vessel that cannot be um, dismissed. That vessel of Aquarian selfhood, that, you're, that jug of carrying the healing elixir that we are all parts of each other. Aquarius is born knowing we are all parts of each other, is confounded by People in governments don't acknowledge that. And, and, and when all of that becomes this initiation where you, you claim your belonging absolutely fully to the free range of spirit, and that atomized mist is how you come down from spirit into the fields of incarnation, but you do not get trapped on either side. You gain freedom and fluency. You speak two languages. You're a citizen of both lands. Neither one has an entire hold on you by itself. You belong to both of it, and you belong to this third thing, 
that is the art that you're performing in learning how to navigate the two extremes. Anybody want to say something? I'm I'll reading in from the Aquarian Ray. Oh, go ahead, Marianne, please. Well, just a quick thing. Um, my my Chiron is in Aquarius at my midheaven. <laughs> so I'm, I'm feeling like um, this is quite the initiation here and quite the healing. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for acknowledging the mystic initiatory side of the teaching. Thank you. Yeah, coming in on the Aquarian beam, I'm, I'm really feeling that, um, bringing that mist, you know, like this, this place where heaven meets earth so much more strongly where I can tap it from where I am. Like I don't have to leave to get to it and then come back and travel between. It's, a, it's something that I am now being able to just bring into here now. Be beautiful, beautiful. And I'm sure Hawaii has something to do with that as well, but it's not only attributed to Hawaii. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a beautiful frothy version of incarnation. It can be. It's, it's a mixture too, because it's mixed with a lot that's not that. Um, but yeah, that's beautiful, Lily. That's really, it really feels like the next stage of your Aquarian bridge building project is going to come into place now. Because Aquarians, Aquarius is the bridge builder, and, and you can't build a bridge without thoroughly investigating the territories on both sides of the gap. So you, you, have, to, uh, you, you have to spend extensive visits in the land of spirit where, where you uh, dream walk, you know, where you connect with those other forces, the spirit forces, the other dimensions where you're still connecting with them, even when you're focused on the here and now, even if you were driving a car, you're still doing that with them there. And when you're Aquarius, you're the most multidimensional of all. And so, so what happens is, is that as you bring the part of yourself down here that, um, that can get absolutely involved with everything, but from a viewpoint of freedom and magic and understanding, you know, that uh, without getting trapped there and you, you grant yourself the dual citizenship. So um, it's just, it's, it's beautiful to witness, just to witness the art. I just wanna weave in here too that the the how of what you're describing or the process that you're describing of being these dual citizens that are bridging these pieces feels so coherent in a way in that sometimes the experience can feel so lost when you haven't fully anchored in either one or you're just anchored in one and you're longing for the other and and so the way you're conjuring it, I feel like it actually has implications to it that are much greater than even how it's working within us, because then it's also showing us how we do that with all of the other parts of ourselves and the elemental beings and the invisible ones and the worlds within the worlds. So what an incredible opportunity to, to really surrender to that process of how we actually bridge within. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, that's, that the, that's the Aquarian multidimensional grid. And, and, so, and so even while you're here attending this class in that body, at that spot, at this time, that's not all you are. You're, you're also, you're, you're, your whole spheric um, nature is way, way bigger and broader and multidimensional and multidimensional in time. So while you're sitting there, you are doing something in a past life. You're doing many things in many past lives. That's not, you know, that's not the only thing Isabel is doing is sitting there with her thumbs together and the guitar behind her. 
It's that Isabel is sitting there with her thumbs together and the guitar behind her. And in some earlier life, she's giving birth or making love or dying. And, and, and at the same time, your consciousness isn't restricted to the local area of your body. So even while you're sitting here in this class, you're communicating in a council of wise spirit beings that are your, your allies, your bright sky team that help you bring down these evolutionary surges and impulses at times like this, especially now, right down into the anchor point, you know, which is the, the Aquarian lightning rod so that that higher celestial force can come all the way down into the ground of, of, the, of common um, human experience where it's most needed. It's the masses that need to awaken in the time of Aquarius. It's, it's mass consciousness. And, and, and so what we're going through here is this um, incredible reminder, this, this galactic reminder that, that you are so much more than your, um, your normal human personality could ever imagine. You are so much more. Whatever part of you is flummoxed or trapped by incarnation at this time, in any way, whatever part of you is flummoxed or trapped by incarnation right now, in any way, politically, Trump, physiologically, health in your body, the fate of the human race in your immediate environment, the destruction of Earth's environment, and anything that is plaguing you and hounding you right now in your incarnational body is something you agreed to be alive through because of its initiatory value. If you can go through the shadow of our times, the great shadow of fear and wrongness, if you can go through the great darkness of our time and use it to become more alive inside rather than dead, more present than absent, more open than closed, you, you, you complete the great Aquarian bridge building project we began in the 1960s. Because in the 1960s, collective humanity began to awaken en masse to what Aquarius was born knowing that you and I have so much more in common than we ever have apart. That, 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 that we all drink the same water and breathe the same air. That, we, that everyone on earth has far more in common than they have apart, regardless of how it looks in any kind of a way. That's the great truth Aquarians are born knowing and the Aquarian part of each of us is born knowing but mass consciousness started to get in the 1960s. That was the big consciousness revolution of that time. I'm a part of you. You're a part of me. Can we stop pretending that we're not? And can we just act that way? What? Can we just stop pretending that we're not love? Come on. How long are we going to play the game of not being love? Which is another word for society. You could call modern society not being love because that's one of the main things it teaches. So, so if you don't want to play that game, like many of us did in the 60s, you just got to drop out of it. That's all. Oh, not, you've got to refuse to play it. I'm not going to refuse the game of not being love and magic. Shit, I, I am going to refuse that game. I am going to refuse the game of not being love and magic. And I'm going to try the new game of being love and magic. <laughs> I'm going to try out blissful atomized Aquarian mists of frothy Hawaiian evolution streaming into the blood cells of the karmic species of our race. You know, that human collective karma, which is of the few lording over the many. That's the main collective karma. The, the corrupt elite few lording over the many. It, it, we did it in Atlantis, and it's happening again now. And some of the key modern players are the ones who did the same thing in Atlantis and kept reincarnating without getting the lesson, without waking up to what they'd done. So we're kind of reflooding the flood to unflood it. And, and the Aquarian um, part of this is Aquar the first age of Aquarius was the first age of humanity. 
Lemuria, Mu, otherwise known as Eden, paradise. In that stage, it was prior to the division of the genders. We were, everyone was just everything. There was no ego, there was no separation. That is the first age of Aquarius. And Aquarius, which is usually looked at as the most forward-looking progressive evolutionary sign, is actually the most ancient because Aquarius remembers on a cellular level what that was like to not be divided. Aquarius remembers cellularly, if not consciously, what it was like to have no I and thou to have no man and woman, person and plant, star and Venus. It's all, all, it's just all. And so that part of Aquarius, which is usually looked at as pushing forward to some imaginary utopia is history for Aquarius. That is not imaginary. In fact, what is imaginary is this delusional world culture that has sprung up on the back of a beautiful living planet. That's what's fucking imaginary. To imagine that we're not love, to imagine that we're not each other, to imagine that, we're, that we're, we need to be afraid of each other, that we need to be scared of everything different. That's what's fucking imaginary. All you need is love isn't imaginary. It's the deepest truth of all. So at this time with Jupiter and Saturn entering Aquarius, the tension of opposites is how we build the bridge. The tension, because a Democrat is a Republican is a Democrat, is a Republican is a Democrat is a Republican. A Jew is an Arab is a Jew is an Arab is a Jew is an Arab. A man is a woman is a man is a woman. A gay is a straight is a gay is a straight. Everyone is each other. There is no separation. There are no intrinsic differences. When you stop pretending in any kind of way that there are, and when you stop supporting a world culture that constantly drums in that message, you bring on the age of Aquarius and you build the bridge. You join the bridge builders rather than the polaric dividers. You holify yourself, which means everything you think about and touch and do has more wholeness in it because you're streaming it through the Aquarian vessel. Aquarius is a jug of a, an imperfect personality carrying the healing elixir of our togetherness. That's the Aquarian jug. It sloshes around and it spills. Aquarius carries as a jug the knowledge of our togetherness and, and, sh and she carries that up to the precipice of many gaps in order to gain the understanding to survey the ground on both sides of the polarity. And, and, and once doing that, lays her body down across the gap and leaves that part of her there, even while she goes about her work shape-shifting in the multidimensional universe of her nature. So her body's laying down on that gap because she surveyed the ground adequately on both sides of it. She realized that both factions have far more in common than they would ever admit. She, and in that realization, she puts her, uh, her consciousness across the gap and leaves it there. She puts the body of her knowing there. And then she goes off to do all the other things she's doing because there's all these other dimensions of her. That's just one little part of her. It might as well stay there with a fixity, with an Aquarian fixedness. It's, it's the power of, of the integrity of the truth of love. That's what that atomized mist is. The power of the integrity of truth and love. Okay, anybody else want to say something? Uh, I got a little something there. Uh, just to add to that, another uh, another analogy would be uh, like snow. It's like the river 
we all come from the same cloud, but we're uh, each snowflake is different, separate. But at the same time, we all come from the same cloud and we all land in the same heap, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, that, and, and, uh, and as far as the uh, quantum lives going on at the same time, it's, it's kind of a, feels like a conundrum, but it also feels really like something that could actually be happening because I just had a dream this morning about, I was just in another place and I was, it was just as much as real as us sitting right here, you know? It was just the yeah. real, I mean, you know, it, it was just, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's probably true. We're probably just all, we got all these other lives going on. We, we you know, in different areas. So that's anyway. right. That's right. That's beautiful, Gray. And, and that's why one of the things I talk about is it's, it's more accurate to think of you as, as the Gray network than to think of you as Gray. You know, to think of Mireya as the Mireya network, right? Because what happens is then your humanness becomes the most physical um, anchor for your multidimensionality. It doesn't become a refuge away from your multidimensionality and your multidimensionality doesn't become an escape from the rigors of your humanness. This is the great Aquarian maturation initiation process, right? So... So, so when the awareness of all the other parts of you enhances your presence here on earth, you've got the best of both worlds. Now showing up for my human lessons and my human beingness isn't an escape from rising to fulfill my highest spirit consciousness. It's the way to rise and fulfill my highest spirit consciousness, because if I anchor that um, ascension in, in, in my, the truth of my mortality, the truth of my humanness in my body, um, it's like this lightning rod. I draw down the celestial lightning all the way through, and, and, and I rise up. From coming down, I rise up. It's like a yogic stretch. You know, it's like if you're, if you're doing a standing pose like the tree, you know, the more you push down, the higher you can rise up, right? And so that's, it's that yogic stretch. So, so if you can become more present, more human, more fully arrived in such a way that you learn to track with the branches of your consciousness that are moving through many different dimensions in many different centuries on many different planets. I mean, think of all the people your soul has made love to. <laughs> you know, it's like if you've made love with 200 people in this life, you've probably made love with 10,000 people in all your past lives. And think of how many people, those people you made love to in all those lives made love to. It's like, how could we not be each other? How could we all not be each other? It's, it's, it's totally impossible. And, and so now you're showing up and you're here in the body and you're coming alive, but you're not fooled into getting trapped in that delusion that that's all that's happening. And, and, and you're not getting trapped in the illusion that you have very limited resources to bring to bear on that particular situation. See that, because those are the main human traps. You get trapped into so over identifying with the exigencies of the particular situation that you forget that you're an angel and that you were dead and you came back again. You forget everything, except I got to deal with this. And then um, you limit the option of what resources you have to draw upon to bring to bear because you're overly human at that moment, you know? And, and, and so, when the next exigency comes up, like, you know, what we're seeing all around the world right now, every living moment, fear, lies, paranoia, destruction, when those all come up, and they're all going on right now in the whole biosphere, and you show up for them, instead of running away from them, and you enter into them, realizing you have about 10,000 more times 
of magic than you would ever need to deal with whatever's happening down there on earth. Oh my God, if you could Aquarianize, if you could absolutely claim the channels that you have, fucking shit, man, you are a million times overqualified to deal with anything that happens on earth between birth and death. And so when you recognize that, and that doesn't steal you away from showing up and dealing with it, but it inspires you, it magics you, it, it sweeps you through it with this Aquarian double wave consciousness that even on the lower wave, oh my God, yeah, incarnation, Donald Trump, homo holy shit, everything happening, pandemic, right? And, 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 and that higher Aquarian wave is, yeah, and I am so with that in every possible way and completely free of it because I'm getting involved with it in a magic way, authentic to myself. That's that double wave. I have two things to weave in, Mark. Is this an okay time? Yeah. All right. I have something personal and then I've got something to come in through Facebook. Um, when you were referencing how many lives we're living simultaneously and the whole quantum piece too that Gray was bringing in, I really felt how powerful circle is in part because of all the invisible allies that gather around when we speak truth. Yeah. When we have these conversations that honor those greater networks and those greater worlds that are all connecting through us in this point in time. So I just want to acknowledge that. I want to thank you for actually being a conduit for that and the impact that has on each and every one of us when we come in and we say yes and we can feel it because I can tell that the beam that happens that all of those that are actually really wanting to help infuse us with what's needed for these times, they get conjured by us lighting up in this moment. And then some of those guides go with us. And so even when we leave these circles, we're just fortified in ways that we're not. If we are not beaming with those things that are sort of permeating through the world. So I just, really want to acknowledge the conduit that these circles are and that speaking truth is. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. We, we light up like Christmas candles. We, we light up, we, we light up and that sends flares through the collective fog. You know, when you, when you light up like this time of year, like a Christmas candle, like a solstice wreath, you know, when you light up with that, with that recognition, oh, this is just something I'm going through. This is just incarnation. Oh, yeah, I was starting to forget that Mark Borax life in 2020. I, I was getting a little lost there in my galactic roamings. And I, was, I, and I was forgetting, oh, yeah, there's that Mark Borax dude who's the current physical host of your soul, right? There's that Mark Borax vessel. I better go back and pay some attention to that dude because, you know, because he's because he's carrying it, you know, he's not the thing itself. He's just the Aquarian vessel. He's not the truth. He's just, he's just a messenger. And, and if he can clear his own nature sufficiently, then all of that galactic support that wants to come through will just come streaming through because, because that's how existence works. I existence has elegance, meaning the, the fewest operations produce the greatest positive result. And there's an elegance to the universe. It wants to work as easily as possible, where the, the slightest effort produces the greatest positive result. Uh, you, you're a human being and you're a part of the universe, so that means that that's the way that you want to work. The way humanity wants to work is that the slightest effort produces the greatest positive results. That, that's how all things want to work. And so they don't always work that way because things go out of orbit and resistances occur. And, and, and the greatest resistance of our time is that collective humanity has either forgotten that we are all parts of each other or is refusing to act that way. 
it really it doesn't really matter that much which one it is regardless of whether collective humanity has forgotten that or it knows it but has chosen not to do it that's the resistance that once we remember once you remember that you are a free multi-dimensional being moving through many time streams in many bodies in many ways and and that and that you're living during a time of tremendous death and birth tremendous death and birth a whole way of being is dying and and it, and we started to feel that and we started to know that in the 1960s a whole way of being is dying in many of those songs in the music of that era you can hear people singing and addressing the dying and the living what's going out what's coming in and and so that that awakening that we are all parts of each other and we're made of love and we're these magical beings when when the knowing of that is something that's no longer debatable but just is um, you make it through the initiation and, and then you ground that knowledge of oneness into your actions and your intentions and your friendships, the Aquarian collective. It's, it's much easier for an Aquarian to identify with the whole than with the self. This is why Aquarian selfhood is much different. Um, all the other signs, except for Pisces, it's way it's 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 way easier for all the other signs to identify first with themselves and second with everything, with the universe. For Aquarius, it's opposite. It's it's hard for Aquarius to believe in the realness of her own identity. It's hard for her to really pay a whole lot of attention in, to the way she's being. It's kind of like, oh, that's just the human thing. God, haven't we gotten past that yet? You know, and so it takes this this kind of funny backwards initiation to to find a way to believe sufficiently enough in everything in the perfection of the grand design first then to be able to believe in the self because you're part of that design in, until Aquarius and until the Aquarian age gets it that we are all from love and magic we are all united the whole universe is together there is no separation except in the mind of humanity Outside of the mind of humanity, there is no separation. And even the mind of humanity just imagines that there's separation. And once we get that, then, um, then the knowledge of that wholeness enables Aquarius to strengthen her vessel of selfhood and believe in it enough as the, as the imperfect deliverer of a perfect message of love. A cracked vessel is still a vessel. It can still pour uh, a truth. It can still pour truth through. Okay, anybody else got something to say? Let me weave in this piece from Facebook. Oh, yes. Sorry. No, that. Okay. So this is from Frankie. Um, he's been in our circles before. And um, she was, I kind of rephrased it because it was I, hard to say it exact. Um, she was wanting you to speak about the 20 year cycle and of Saturn and Pluto, but I think she may have met Saturn and Jupiter. I'm not sure. Cause I know that Saturn. Yeah. Yeah. That's what she meant. Cycle. Um, yeah. and how those 20 year cycles create a 40 year cycle that's sort of activating the mastery of the way showers and how that's helping the mass consciousness come into this energy field that you're describing here. Yeah, I think. I don't know that I can do that consciously because that's a tall order. That's a good class there. It's not just a one minute response, but, but I can, I can suggest trying to do that musically because in the 1960s, um, we, we had these message songs of people waking up, waking up, waking up in the 1980s. There was a whole different range of music, which, which you're a lot better of addressing than I am because, you know, I tuned out of, um, I tuned out of pop radio music uh, in the mid in the late 1970s. You know, I didn't I didn't track with with 80s and 90s music like that. And so you can just kind of see that that each conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn 
is where the past and the future meet in the same place to gain the lessons of what's happened before and to launch the initiative of a new thing that wants to happen, which you can trace um, based on the signs that they're, that they're conjuncting in. And so, um, and so, all right, let me, let me grab my ephemeris. Oh yeah, this is gonna be good. Thanks, Frankie, I like this one. So, so I forget where, where Jupiter and Saturn conjoined in the 60s. That's what I'm looking up. It'd be interesting to see where they can join in 2040 as well. That's Libra. That's going to be Libra. Yeah. Cool. Wow. So, yeah, where did they... Yeah, I'm not finding it. I think it's Capricorn, Mark, isn't it? In the 60s? I think so. Is that the time around when you were born? I wasn't born under that okay. conjunction, okay. but in the beginning of the 60s, I think that was the Capricorn, Jupiter, Saturn, around 61, 62. Okay, let's see. Jupiter, Saturn. Yeah, you're right, Capricorn. Okay, so we got the Capricorn one in the early 60s. And um, so that's Saturn and Capricorn. Uh, that one. That was a summons um, to build a new world. Okay, that's what that one was. The summons to build a new world. We, we half succeeded and half failed at that one. The building of the new world in the 1960s. I, I, was, a, I was a part of it then. I remember it. I remember the 60s very, very deeply and strongly because I hitchhiked from um, Connecticut to San Francisco to get in on the tail end of it. Uh, when I was a kid, and um, and that really sprung me into the the '60s thing. So that so then in the '80s, let's see, where did they come together then? Libra. Oh, that was Libra. Okay, okay. So that one in the '80s, that one uh, ushered in a a kind of renewal of. Um, of monogamous love, um, the Libra thing of bonding deeply, strongly with one person. Um, the '60s kind of exploded that, and people were trying a lot of uh, experiments with love. And and then um, in the '70s, it wasn't too fashionable. In the '80s, people started, kids started being born then, who could who could pair up in a way um, that, that we, we were becoming cynical of as a, as a culture. Then, um, then 2000, where was that? In the 2000s road. Well, I tried to look something up, but I think it's more sidereal astrology. Yes. Like I think it's putting the positions. Weren't they all lined up in Taurus right around then? Everything? In um in like somewhere in the two thousands? Like in May. In May of what, two thousand? Yes. Let's see. Yeah, uh, May two thousand they were in Taurus. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the Taurus one. 20 years ago. All right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that was, uh, Taurus is the gift of innocence and offering. And so, so that was a, a kind of a fresh energy coming in. And I think a lot of the kids who were born around then really have that. This, these kids that are like 20 these days. Um, I've, I've known several of the young men around that generation um, there's this gift of innocence and offering. Um, 
you know, because the the civilization that 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 today's youth has to grow out of is filled with um, inauthenticity, like crazy compared to the kids themselves who have that more kind of Torian innocence that that your life is an offering and that it's not up to you how the offering is received. It's only up to you to keep purifying the offering. So, 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 so that, that was brought in last time, uh, leading to the first degree of Aquarius. So the one that's um, here and, and, and especially going to be here a few minutes after midnight Eastern time tonight um, is, is about um, transmuting duality into oneness. And, and so, um, so the polarizations of our time are acting out like crazy, um, partly because they sense that their days are numbered. And um, things seem to come on more intensely when their days are numbered, because <laughs> some part of them knows it. So uh, discord, hyperpolarization are acting out like crazy all over the planet right now as a dramatic exposition to show us what we have to outgrow and transmute. Mireya. Yeah, um, I'll see if I can verbalize this because I find this piece so fascinating, right? Around what are the seeds that are being planted right now for these 20 years and um, I'm, I'm thinking what this question, right? What is different from the 60s? What What is this now bringing? Because I know you talk so much about it, right? In terms of this being almost like another octave of it. And yet we know there are certain things that are so different, right? And are needed of, from all those learnings. And I, I was thinking of the, you know, the other two big companions to this conjunction with Pluto still in Capricorn and Neptune in Pisces, as you know, some of what you were saying, like the it feels almost like the big difference to be able to integrate these Aquarian polarization and bridge building that you're talking about is really inviting a sense of the group and a sense of the other that is 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 not as abstract as Aquarius can do it sometimes, you know, where it get it stays in the high of the multidimensionality and abstraction and is really inviting us to feel and see the other in their otherness and their story and their pain. And can we sit together in it, right? And 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 lift each other up in it and have the hope in it together without this, that separation that you were talking at the beginning, um, in a way where we bring the human heart um, in a way it hasn't, right? N not just almost through the mind, but that there, there's something here, I feel we're, we're being asked as a humanity and as a group to do differently um, in all those learnings we've had through the Capricorn, through the all that you talk about with Capricorn and accepting our our you know messed upness in a certain way and and yet to do it knowing that right there's another person next to me that is dying of COVID at the same time or is you know celebrating whatever else or like there's just perhaps you have better words than me but there, there's something there that I feel feels so unique about how, the how of how we need to do it in these next 20 years so we can really bring the integration um, that is that these two are asking the the Jupiter and Saturn yes yes thank you thank you for that that um, that has a few different threads in it that I won't be able to respond to all of them but I want to respond to a couple of them um, which is how is the transformation that we are being summoned into of our time different from the one in the 60s? And I wanna start by addressing that one because um, it's, it's very powerful. One thing is that um, uh, Pluto 
in Capricorn, Neptune in Pisces, and Jupiter, Saturn in Aquarius, those are the three wisdom signs, the winter signs. Capricorn begins the three wisdom wintry signs. Aquarius carries the torch over to Pisces. And so we're, we're having powerful, dominant outer planets and, and, and wisdom planets all in the wisdom signs. And what we lacked in the 60s was wisdom. We lacked the wisdom of our experience. What we had in the 60s was the innermost knowing that what is going on is wrong and we have to break out of it. We were absolute with that one, but we, we disagreed on ways how to do that. And we underestimated what it was gonna take to carry that revolution throughout the whole world. And, and the heart consciousness of um, the Aquarian prediction that this is the time of the awakening of the heart consciousness of collective humanity. That, that this is the time that we either all make it through the cosmic cervix or that none of us do. That it's the end of false division. It's the end of false specialization. It's the return of the recognition that, uh, that we are all made of love, that, that we all have something crucial to offer, that we're all here for um, very good reasons, and that each of us is so much more than we appear to be. And when, when the heart consciousness that exploded in the 1960s meets the wisdom of what we've learned since then and how, like, like John Lennon was correct, all you need is love. He just had no idea. None of us had any idea what it was gonna take to live that. And he said it but he never got to live it fully because he was cut down. And John was right. All you need is love, but you have to anchor it deep in body and soul and trust it and not let it close your eyes to any of the um, to any of the work that you're doing down here on Earth, which is always different in each of our cases. So, so, so the main way that the transformation of the '60s, Maria, differs from the one now is the wisdom element indicated by all those higher planets in the three wisdom signs. There were other threads to what you were saying. Um, but I don't remember them right now. Is there, is there one of them that's feeling like it, it wants me to address it? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's good. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> All is good. All is good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm also so moved to, to also just acknowledge that it does feel like culturally we are so much more aware than we were in some ways in the 60s of holding a greater picture. And so while it makes sense and it serves for us to have our own stories, right, of how awakening is happening, it's like John Lennon had his message and so did Freddie Hampton, you know, who started the Rainbow Coalition and who also was killed. So, so many of our people that were making a stand for the future that hopefully we are crossing into, they were taken out, right? So, and there's so many orientations towards this larger story, right, that we're all being a part of. And I hope that 
part of the wisdom that's carrying us forward is helping us to be able to weave our stories with all of the other stories that makes them so much stronger and so much more powerful together when we know that not it, it's true we're not getting through that cervix alone it's either everyone is going or no one is going so how do we keep lifting up all of the stories of change and liberation and possibility for all peoples that have occurred through so many different lenses and so many different stories so we can actually feel our ancestors past and future really conjuring us like conjuring us forward it's just yeah 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 and that's part of the the aquarian um miracle it's it's that it's that you're you are backed up by, uh, by long lines of forebears, progenitors, um, karmic relatives who, who you're not blood related to in this life, but you're karmically related to from past lives. You, you're, and in fact, um, cancer, one of the most beautiful gifts I got from Elias Lonsdale was, was that uh, the sign of cancer contains a, a reservoir of all the good things that anybody ever did. And what a, just what a beautiful reservoir. Cause we're always hearing about the opposite, like the perpetuation of negative cycles, you know? And here's the opposite of that, that, that every good thing that any human being ever did since the dawn of the species pours into cancer and you get to drink from it. You get to, you get to serve others thirst from it. You get to dip into that. It's, it's bottomless. It's, it's endless. It's bottomless that, that, yeah, so what the world is ending, but are you going to open to love? You still have a choice, you know, make the worst of the worst of the worst, you know, so what humanity is perishing and the world is ending. Do I want to love that or hate it? And, and, and if you can do that with the worst of the worst of the worst, then anything else is easier, <laughs> you know? And so, so um, it's, I don't mean in a frivolous way, oh yeah, they're all destroying the world and, and who gives a shit? That's not what I mean at all. I just mean that as a magical being, you are dead, you are alive, you are in between dead and alive, you were never either dead or alive, you are absolutely existing and you never even existed. It, it, you're not one side of any polarity. You're the whole axis. You're the whole length of it. And once you recognize that and stop pretending to be anything less than that, all of a sudden existence offers you its greatest wisdoms, its greatest lessons. And, 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 and you open to the fact that, that you are infinitely free that that you could never be trapped and that you're absolutely trapped and you're absolutely stuck you don't devalue one side at the expense of the other yeah i am fucking human oh shit and i'm gotta deal with this human stuff and i got my body and my body has bowels and, blah, and it's the mud and karma and blood and, blah, and all of that has to be true. It has to give you its lessons, but none of it need trap you or delude you into thinking that that's all you are, because that's just a fraction of who you are. But it's a very important fraction because it physicalizes all the rest of yous. <laughs> and so when you anchor in that, in that humanity without getting trapped in it, now you can be all the rest. Now, now, now it all feeds in this interactive elegance of the least amount of effort producing the greatest positive result. May I jump in? Yeah. One of the, my favorite sayings that I work with on a regular basis is that I'm bringing spirit into matter and transmuting matter into spirit in any given situation and at all times. And the more I can remember that, the more the magic comes. Mm. Um, I'd also like to say that as I was probably an adolescent when the 60s were really unfolding. So I was relegated to sitting back and watching it. Wasn't really allowed to participate, you know? But I was really paying attention. And I think that in the 60s, 
so many seeds were planted um, in humanity and in our consciousness that I feel over these last 40 years, 40, 50, 60 years, however many it's been, um, that those are the seeds that have been germinating, sprouting and growing and came through my children. And now my grandchildren are just these amazing beings because that consciousness was held throughout all of it. And you really see the connection. Yeah, I almost feel like my children furthered it along in the places that I couldn't quite break through at that time. My kids picked up that torch and took it to the next level. And now these little ones coming through, look out world. <laughs> It'll be one big, great love fest. I'm sure of it. <laughs> beautiful, yeah. beautiful, beautifully put, Marianne. And, uh, and, uh, and a sweet, sweet reminder of, of how our consciousness uh, planted deep seeds that sprouted up years later and are still sprouting up. I had one thing to address Mireya's mind um, question, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, for me, the Aquarian mind that's coming through right now is not that abstract out there thing like you're talking about or the analytic or any of that. But for me, it's starting to come into the field of the heart and be held by the heart and be an ally to the heart and the breath. And so that when I breathe, I can direct the mind, you know, by following my breath to any part of my body or to anywhere, any element in the world that I'm connecting with, any person on any level, any place in my past or future, anywhere, I can connect. I can bridge through my heart mind, you know, and so the, the mind is being held in this much larger field and it's integrating, like you were saying, more into the earth. It's not you know, it's, it's tethered more. It's not tethered. It's like integrated more. Beautiful, beautiful. And that conjures up uh, many images for me of the, of the multidimensional Aquarian grid, the, the network, just, just like a human body. If a person is having an imbalance in their kidneys, an acupuncturist could put uh, a needle in their calf, in their knee, and in their elbow and in their neck and their forehead. And the imbalance of the kidneys will release because the acupuncturist is choosing to address the multi-grid rather than the localized kidney. And instead of assuming that the kidney is acting out purely for no reasons or for selfish reasons of its own and will medicate it back into submission, the, the acupuncturist recognizes that we are all everyone. We are all everything. All the energy of the universe wants to flow through all the meridians of the universe, including you and I. And so um, Earth is a congested acupuncture point of the galactic network. Earth is a stuck point because human consciousness has grown uh, densely delusional, mainly in, in forgetting or refusing to believe that we are all made of love and that we're all part of each other. It's a stuck organ, you know, it needs to be acupunctured. And, and every time that you have a little um, penetration of the veil, a, a pushback of the illusion, any, any time the illusion that this is not love, that we are not love, that we are not all one, any time that illusion pops, it's that acupuncture needle point. It's like, and now all of a sudden, your energy is flowing through you to clear the organ clear the vessel, the Aquarian vesselhood. Any other people who wish to speak? I, I feel called to weave in two points that you made earlier, Mark, which um, were really profound. And one was the imagery of Aquaria laying down and bridging these two different points. And that image combined with how it's the tension of opposites that's building the bridge feels like a really important thing to recognize because 
sometimes our Aquarian consciousness and whatever we are holding in that field of energy, you know, mine's Mars, but we're not always aware when we're actually laying ourselves down and we're able to bridge those opposites that what goes across that bridge is not necessarily holding the consciousness that originally bridged it. And so the conflict and turmoil and tension that arises as we come into this Aquarian age is actually potentially one of the signs that we're bridging and how we hold that with a context that allows it to find its consciousness within the field of experience that it needs to find it in seems like a very powerful and profound way to walk these next at least immediate years. Yeah. Yeah, that's the work. That that is the work of our time. That that when you recognize a taut point, a stretched point, you know, when you recognize a a, a divisive polarization, you have to enter into the situation magically and uh, realistically enough to gain the truth of each side and then generate a third point that doesn't negate anything the other two are saying. It just opens up the energy. So, so the opposition is trined. So the line becomes a triangle. So the, so the, so the greater flow can just keep going through, you know, and, and, and that's the work of our time. That's the underlying secular shamanism of the Aquarian age that in the marketplace, in a car or while making love, we can all be secular shamans now that Aquarius has arrived, you know, and that's the secular shamanism. You could do that in the grocery store or watching TV or drinking beer or teaching a class or writing a book or by yourself or with your cat. I mean, it, it's, it's as we realize that there is a flow here and, 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 and evolution wants to flow. Life didn't get, to be born into existence because of its need to not be here. <laughs> Life decided to get born into existence because of its need to be here. And, and, and yet when here is recognized as not the only dimension you inhabit, but a very crucial one, you know, it's very good to inhabit the physical dimension as long as you have carrying a body through it. And so, um, you know, I highly recommend inhabiting your body when you're driving a car and cooking with fire or, or making love or you know riding a motorcycle and things like that so so when you learn how to inhabit the fullness of your very human experience uh, without sacrificing inhabiting at least some of the rest of the major dimensions of you uh, uh, then what happens is you establish, you unclear stuck acupuncture points in the grid. It, it, it's the Lily network. It's not just Lily, you know? And, and in that network, um, wow, there are so many sources you can draw from for a, a allies, energies, inspirations, visions. You know, it, when you claim the fullness of your grid, all the things each of your past lives learned all the things each of your future lives, which hasn't even happened yet in the physical, learned, all the um, disembodied human beings and spirit beings are communicating with you, people on the other side of the world who you have no relationship with are talking to you, and, and the, the well of cancer is giving you the reservoir of the good deeds of everyone who ever lived to draw from, then, whatever crazy Aquarian age conundrum you're facing, it ends up just being an invitation more than a nightmare. We're turning nightmares to invitations. Our ecstatic nightmares. <laughs> well, I was thinking of that actually when you were talking about- Are we gonna talk about this again? No, 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 not that one all the different parts of ourselves and how much of the experience is just remembering that we identify 
what are we identifying with? Are we identifying with the nightmare or are we identifying with the dream? Like, what are we identifying with? And that can come all the way back into this body and this lifetime or going out, out, out into these other realms of experience and connection points. So I think it's really important to be able to acknowledge the nightmare because we all can get off this call and have an experience where all of a sudden we are just pulled down and it can be so extreme that it, it takes a real lot to hold the totality of the experience that's happening and yeah, keep finding our way through it. Yeah. Yeah. Not only are some of the people when they get out of this class could walk right directly into a nightmare. Some of the people who are teaching this class are walking to the nightmare, even while they're teaching it. I know. Did you check out the dishes? Holy God, what happened? Are we a little busy right now or what? <laughs> Domestic and, bliss is not happening right now. <laughs> Aquarius is the great reversal. This is a an idea that has been in mystic tradition um, for a long time, the great reversal. And um, and so what's happening now is that um, everything that has been deeply inside you is coming out now and needing to come out. And everything that has been outside you and far away from you is coming in now and needing to come in um, because it's a cross fertilization. And, and, and it's also, um, to continue answering uh, Maria's former question, it's different than the great love transformation of the 60s because we were highly polarized back then. You know, if, if you were hitchhiking, and I hitchhiked around the United States, I, at, at 16, I hitchhiked from Connecticut to California, and I kept hitchhiking all over. And if you were hitchhiking, if you saw a Volkswagen bus getting ready to pull off the internet, you knew you had a ride. And you knew when you got in, there was going to be this long-haired, blonde-haired guy with a hookah in the back offering you a hit off the water pipe. It, and, and, and if you saw someone driving a, soup, driving a souped up Chevy, that they were going to go right, pat, blow right past you, and they were a juicer rather than a head. They, they drank alcohol rather than smoked pot. And, and as sophomoric as that kind of polarization was back then, I miss it. There was something about it that I really loved because it was just so clear. It was just so clear. If you had a if you had a, a crew cut hair and drove a souped up Chevy, you were for the war. And if you drove a Volkswagen bus and had long hair and smoked pot, you were against the war. It made it really easy. But but that level of polarization was also part of our youth and inexperience, not not part of our wisdom. You know, that whole thing back then of what was it? Never trust anybody over 30. What was it? Yeah, all, all the stuff back then that was, if you look at it now, it is so fucking hyper polarized, right? Even back then, you know, Jerry Garcia, even at the time said, uh, guys, I think you need to look at this situation with the longer view, <laughs> you know, like, do we even want to be able to be existing by the time we're 30? And, and so, you know, it was hyper hyperpolarized. So, so the transformation of this time uh, gets to be wiser and not as polarized. Like, like now I can't tell with, well, almost no one drives Volkswagen buses anymore. So I sort of still can tell, but you know, now it's just somebody could have short hair or long hair or be into rock or be into bluegrass and still either be on God, there, there isn't even a war anymore. The war is the war in reality. We don't have any Vietnam War because they've covered up all the wars we're fighting, especially in the U.S. You know, we're doing way worse shit than we did in Vietnam and, and nobody gives a damn. And so, so the war that's now is the war on truth. It's the war on reality. That's the one that we all have in common because the Vietnam War uh, organized the women's movement, the gay movement, the civil rights movement, all under the same umbrellas of stop the war. That was the gift of the Vietnam War. It's the war on truth, the war on reality that has to do that today. Everyone all over the planet, regardless of their belief systems or color of their skin or anything, is, is a victim of the war on truth. And, 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 and we, we break, we, we, we end that war 
every time we decide to fully follow our own truth and commit to that more than um, living by somebody else's standards. Any other questions or comments? Gray. Yeah, uh, I'm still having trouble with this part about if we either we all make it or we don't. Um, and the polarization thing is really uh, still really alive. I mean, just look at the Trump people and the Bernie people. I mean, serious thing there. And the only thing you're going to get through, you can't get through the Trump people because they're talking about, it's like, they think it's a football game. Our side against your side, you know, us against you. I mean, there's no, doesn't matter what Trump did or what, how horrific these things are, they're not even going to pay attention to that. They're just, it, it, that's our side. That's it, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the thing is with the polarization, with, with this thing about uh, <clears throat> either we make it or we don't. I think there's still a chance that, you know, maybe this is a proving ground where half of those people, some people don't make it. And some people do. There's groups like this that make it. And there's poop, and there's the groups that you, you, can, you know, they're, they're build, we're building the bridge, they're trying to tear it down. We're planting the seeds, they're pulling them up. So which one, you know, I, I just don't see how these guys are, are, are going to, uh, I, you know, how we're going to bridge that, you know, I mean, I'd love to, I'd, you know, I think that's the best thing ever, <laughs> but, but, you know, there's that chance, I still think that there's part of, there's, there's that group that's not going to make it, you know. Yeah, and that's a valid, that, that's a valid viewpoint. I, I, uh, I understand that viewpoint, but the answer to your question, though, is that how those two, how you're ever going to bridge that particular great divide is to bridge it in yourself. And, and that, that's the only way to do it. So when you gaze at the apparently insurmountable gap between whatever two groups that you're looking at, whichever groups you look at, and you gaze at the apparently insurmountable divide between them, that's a reminder that inside yourself, until you find a way for those two to awaken to the oneness, then you're perpetuating the division. But when you can gaze at the apparently insurmountable divide between any two polarized groups and not let it polarize you, then you're passing the initiation. In other words, until you can find inside yourself the oneness of the link between the two of them, you're, you can't ever answer that question. When looking inside yourself and you can feel it, oh, they're not that different from each other. Now, the, the karmic drama that, that, that looked so insurmountable now becomes more of a teaching lesson than a permanent state. And when you allow its lesson to open some bridge in you between where even the idea of each side of the polarity lives in you, when the electric Aquarian zap opens, so wherever the two live in you, they just whoosh into each other. That then you're passing the initiation. You're allowing all external polarities to bridge even in the way you hold them. And that's all you can do. Is that going to be enough to bring about the external bridge? I don't know, but if anything is, that will. That makes sense, Gray? Sure. Yeah, it makes sense. <clears throat> I don't know if it'll work. 
<laughs> Neither do I. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Isabel? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I wanted to say that I resonated with um, when was shared um, of this, that we are all part of each other. I did this education this whole year where it was about uh, constellation work, family constellation work. And it was so amazing, like also to step into all these roles, into roles of victims, into roles of what is the opposite in English? The word of victim and the like um, the. I'm not sure what is the opposite of a victim, a perpetuator. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. Like and and of, I don't know, bombed out people and people who um, did this, and it's uh, like uh, actually the possibility to step into all roles in a way and connect with the feelings. And there is something where I feel this is also connecting us. Like when we did all this constellation work, there was so much like pain and trauma, but also the thing which is all, um, which is actually the balsam for it. And it doesn't matter on which side, like for the victim or for the um, perpetrator. Side, it's, and there is something so, also so much wisdom that comes through the pain in a way, like standing with this. And it's on, all, it's on both sides always. It's, and I feel there is something also like to go beyond this idea of this both um, poets, like the victim or the other, yeah. And yeah, I wanted to share this and also, um, yeah, this was basically- Thank amazing. you, Don Donka. Yeah. <laughs> Donka. <laughs> yeah, mm. thank you, Isabel. Um, beautiful to hear you speak again. And, and yes, that work, uh, is very sacred. That that work is very sacred. When you go into um, uh, polarized truths, when you go into one side of a polarization, and you get to experience it from that point of view, and you go into an opposite side, or maybe just a different side that's not necessarily opposite, you mm -hmm. go into another side, and experience the whole same thing again. But from that point of view, uh, you're, you're making peace with your various past lives and sub-selves, the inner parts of yourself. And, and it's hard to make peace with your past lives and with your sub-selves until you go into each of them and feel almost overwhelmed by their experience you know, like the experience of somebody who might be opposite you. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's, that, that's the kind of pain that heals and teaches. Mm -hmm. and that, that's powerful. So thank you for bringing that into the circle. It's also real for me in, in um, you're talking about dual citizenship or, mm -hmm. you know, the, the citizenships of the world. I'm, I'm a multi-citizen. And, and it, it's kind of like, you know, born in Africa, like for the first quarter of my life lived there. And so that was, you know, the, the colonizer. Then I go and live in England, you know, the imperial kind of um, culture for many years. And then I come to Australia and I've been inhabit all of those. And each of them is, is really quite complex, but you get to know them all because you've been, you know, right inside them participating yeah. In them. Um, yeah. Yeah. It makes it very rich. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and that's also very Aquarian. The the cosmopolitanism of humanity. That 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 humanity is diverse. And 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 when you see it um, from from the different viewpoints in a way that contributes to 
your compassion and your understanding for people who are very different than yourself, um, that mitigates the fear of people that are very different than yourself. And that turns around the dominant illusion that, that we're supposed to fear everybody different than us. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it starts to um, embrace commonality uh, more than fear of difference. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My experience was very similar, Fiona, in, um, in that I, I never fit into any one circle in my hometown of Stratford, Connecticut, especially from junior high through high school and just afterward. But I did deeply belong to a few of the different circles that had no other connection between each other except for me. You know, I hung out with the, with the hoodlums and the, the, the mafia kids because there was a lot of mafia families in my town. And, and, and their, their children were my friends. And I hung out with, you know, the outlaws, the thieves, the hoodlums, the people who were shooting up heroin uh, into their arm in front of me in the living room. And I hung out with um, the high class kids on the hill, you know, and I, I, I had, I was part of, um, I don't even know how many, I was part of like 20 different circles in a like hundred mile radius of Southern Connecticut in those years, but I couldn't ever fully belong to any of them. And I was the only one who had links between all of them. And, and, uh, and I think as a result of that, or partly it's just because the way that I was born, um, it's impossible for me to try to imagine that I am not everyone and that everyone is not me. I, I, I don't get that option in this incarnation. I can't, I can't ever imagine that, that I'm not Donald Trump. I can't ever imagine that I'm not Adolf Hitler. But I also can't ever imagine that I'm not Jesus Christ and God and Gandhi. I can't imagine that either. And so the, the greatest extremes of what anyone is capable of, I have experienced inside myself in one lifetime or another. So how could I be different than anyone? I, I don't get the luxury of, of imagining that. And so I can relate to your, um, you know, you're the colonizer and the imperialists and the natives, and you know, so beautiful. I'm going to encourage you to wrap up so that we can tell Sky whatever groceries we might need before this giant storm hits. Okay. And that's my Capricornian hurrah for using my power with time. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> well, you're using your power with my time. And <laughs> Hey, that's a little different i think <laughs> uh, um, and uh yeah um gray i just want to say that when you were talking not this last time but the one time before that you were comparing things to snow do you remember what you said exactly there yeah yeah uh it's like you know like you're saying we're in the we're all part of this mist and that we're the cloud <clears throat> and and then each one of us becomes different. We were separate, you know, but we're still all the same. We're still part of the same thing, but we're all very unique. And uh, as, as well, and, and my part of being Pisces is always trying to maintain that uniqueness and not become everybody else's thing, you know? Yeah. It's always been my struggle, so. Yes. There's just that main, yeah, on top of being, uh, you know, we're all one, of course, but at the same time, we're all different. And there's a part of us that want to maintain that our own separate identity, you know, because uh, it's like snowflakes, each snowflake is completely unique and different. And we're all falling, we're all coming down to earth, you know, basically. You know? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, incarnation. Mm -hmm. um, when you first said it, it, it sent the traffic song to my brain, which is uh, Many a Mile. Do you know that song? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's on um, Low Spark of High Hill Boys. Yeah, yeah. So, so as a farewell to the solstice, I just want to sing that song to everybody. Cool. As, as an opening of the solstice window and the great conjunction. Uh, All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today.
Many a mile to freedom, many a tale to tell. Ask my bluebird to sing it from the heart of a wishing well. Call on my reindeer to graze here. Call on my grain to grow. And together we'll flow like the river. And together we'll melt like the snow. And together we'll flow like the river. And together we'll melt like the snow. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Right on. Thank you so much. What beautiful sharing today. So appreciate it. Thanks for this conjuring, Mark. It was really powerful. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Happy solstice. Happy oh, solstice. Also, mm. we're doing a solstice call on Sunday at 4 p.m. No, Saturday. It's Sunday. Oh, it's Sunday. Oh, I said it's it wrong. It's Saturday in your mind, but it's oh, okay. actually on Sunday. Is oh, got it. You're right. We've invited okay. everyone to come. Okay. I said it wrong last time. That's right. fine. I'm just going to move that over in an Aquarian way and bridge it to Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Great. Okay. So we hope you all can join us. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really awesome today. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Hello. Uh, Bye. <laughs> <laughs> you say hello, I say ha. Ha. Ha, 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 ha. No matter how you say ha, I say ha, ha.